and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp. I'm here to usher you into the weekend. It is April 15th. We're right in the middle of April now. A lot of stuff going on in and around the world, but we're going to kick things off with some Montana wolves uh, are being hunted near and around the Yellowstone area at record numbers of wolves killed last year, according to the National Park senior wolf biologist, Doug Smith, who said that the winter saw most of the wolves from Yellowstone National Park killed in a about a century. Of course, you know, a major wolf uh, population has bounced back when it was reintroduced back into Montana in the Yellowstone National Park area. Um, but the whole idea is, idea is like, while they're at Nash uh, Yellowstone National Park, they're safe, but as soon as they step out, tend to have, because they, they usually tend to have over like 100 square miles of grazing, hunting grounds, making it easy then for, to leave the National Park. All native wolves out of Montana basically have been extinct since the 1920s. Um, Canadian wolves were reintroduced in the territory over the course of the last couple decades to repopulate. Their life on the endangered species list kept them safe and also a big point of controversy in the state of Montana, including farmers and just a lot of other things like that. But trappers and hunters like have had a really good hunting season to the point that reflects about 19 wolves this season out of the uh, 200 wolves that are categorized in Montana. This uh, first time I mentioned this was in a story from Montana about wolf watching businesses worried about their uh, tourism season when they can't show wolves because there are fewer. Um, after an outcry from conservational, uh, conservation groups, a lot of the national news media like NPR did a story out this this week and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services is now evaluating whether Endangered Species Act protections should be returned to the wolves in the Northern Rockies. However, they ended the hunting season early in February and are confident that numbers will bounce back. So in other news, uh, a lot of things just happening, this whole thing with the whole, with the Ukraine-Russia invasion. At this point, any Russian troops leaving uh, has been met with shellings of various places. And as soon as I wrapped up last week's show, we had a bombing of a train station that was um, transporting civilians out of the country. Lviv seems to be a lot of their uh, main targets from far away with a lot of those uh, airstrikes and shellings. And these last couple of days have seen major shift in leadership for the troops, for the Russian troops, after the sinking of a Russian warship and adding General Alexander uh, Dmitrikov to the fold. Dmitrikov is known for Russians' involvement in Syria war and has been a major shadow looming over how Ukraine expects Russia to treat this war in Ukraine. But of course, at this point in my war, in this war, in my opinion, Russia seems to uh, seize all the people as uh, all the people in Ukraine as enemies now, with the amount of civilian deaths, mass graves, and constant shelling of hospitals slash schools and basic infrastructure, it's clear that this is a total war. The basic concept of total war is the unrestricted military actions against uh, an opponent, and it seems like this is what it is uh, with uh, sprinkles of corridors, which are just not the case. In terms of any corridors, if used, have uh, trended towards Russia, and so far 4.5 million Ukrainians are out of their homes, and 6 million are displaced in the country as of March 18th. So basically, one out of four Ukrainian people have lost their homes in this war, and those are just based on the March 18th numbers, just mind you. Um, at this uh, point, peace is basically just not being fired upon, and Ukraine has just confirmed Thursday that a 1,000 of their Marines were captured in Mariupol, the port city near the south. As of April 11th this week, Ukrainian President, President Vladimir Zelensky fears the worst as Russia troops mass up for a new offensive in the east. For Russia, when something doesn't happen, expect something real soon. As the Ukraine uh, thing distracts from pretty much everything else, COVID is rearing its old variant head with yet another round of fear mongering. Um, okay, so there's a new variant, the BA2, and um, which is a substrain that started around January of this year and was confirmed soon after. So far, this variant is happening. Um, and in Montana, it usually takes uh, time for us to get impacted by bitter, bigger city infections. So really enjoy this uh, calm before the storm. Um, currently in Missoula, they have an average of about five new cases for a seven-day seven day average and only one hospitalization within the time. Um, I usually go to MissoulaInfo.com, which has the data, and it's available for anyone interested. You can also call them at 251-INFO, otherwise known as 251-4636, to get up-to-date information, vaccines. Uh, I mean, there's so many treatments out there already for this, so it's 
we're kind of transitioning towards the end of the pandemic, but I feel as though like there might be uh, a lot of pushback, which brings me to this next thing called uh, Pandemic Inc., which was a story that was posted on NPR just recently, which highlights those who made profit over the course of the pandemic, marked up masks and other products that the federal government paid for. David McSwain, a ProPublica reporter and author of the new book, Pandemic Incorporated, Chasing the Capitalists and Thieves Who Got Rich While We Got Sick, says a shocking number of those companies had no experience in providing medical equipment. And this story was from NPR.org. You can check it out. It's 44 minutes. It's really in depth. It's kind of crazy. This focuses on uh, the amount of money and over a billion spent. And some of that money wasn't disclosed by the federal government, which is weird. Uh, McSwain's new book is a colorful account of many ways unscrupulous operators profited from the national health crisis and ways the government failed to protect the public from financial predators. So the PPP program was also one of those uh, programs that some people uh, uh, took advantage of, and it was the, uh, the additional pay period for to help uh, get some employees paid through the pandemic as well. And there is a 44 minute listen, and I suggest you guys check that out. Anyways, enjoy a book from someone who themselves will be profiting from the pandemic. Just mind you, it's called Pandemic. He's getting selling a book, he's trying to make a profit. Uh, I mean, come on, it's not much of a, uh, of a proponent of this guy because at this point, this is a reflection and not a solution to what is now becoming an academic, uh, economic crisis through inflation and more. So it's hard all around. And just at the heels of the midterm election cycles, and of course right now I, I, uh, we brought in um, Chief Administrative uh, Direct uh, Elections Official from um, the Muzu County Elections, Brandon Seaman, and he has more to talk about this upcoming election, which has to do with the MCPS Board of Trustees. Hey guys, we're here with Bradley Seaman. He is the Election Administrator for the Muzu County um, and he's here to talk about the upcoming election, more information about how you can uh, register to vote, absentee ballots, just a lot of information we're going to try to dump on you for today. So take it away, Brad. You bet. It's April 13th right now. And so this is a big day because in the county of Missoula, we're mailing out 70,000 ballots for the upcoming school election. So this is a really large election. It covers most school districts throughout the county. Um, we've got levies, trustees, and then we also have some special districts. So there's a couple of fire districts where if you live in Frenchtown or Sealy Lake, you'll get to vote on the trustees for that fire district board. Nice. These are mail ballot election. The election date is gonna be May 3rd. And so on May 3rd, Tuesday, May 3rd, all ballots are due back by 8 p.m. We'll also have 10 drop-off locations all throughout the county. Sealy Lake, Bonner, Lolo, um, Frenchtown, and then a couple of places here in town, the election center and the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. This is gonna be a really big election. All postage yep. is paid on yep. those ballots. So you can just drop it into the ballot box. And also a side note for those of you watching, like you wanna know who your board of trustees is, MCAT just recently did a shoot with the uh, uh, prospective board of trustees. It was great. I actually got a chance to talk to a, um, another interview today about that and stated that you know the school district trustees tend to give out information at their board meetings. Yeah. And so MCAT and School District 1 did a really great review of the different trustees. Right. On the election side, we basically will give you their name and their phone number, try and stay out of nice. any of the campaign materials. Okay, so this isn't necessarily, because you know, everyone knows like, oh, every four years, it's like the big election. Like, mm -hmm. um, and then you have the primary elections. And then there's a lot of these kind of smaller elections that can really impact uh, our community as a whole. And I think those elections in a way are kind of more important because it actually directly affects us in Missoula, Montana. Yeah, it's exactly the size of the district. You know, you're one out of millions of people voting for president. Yep. But when you're talking about a school board, you might be one out of 400 people in your community. Wow. And so that vote, is, every vote is important, but it's so much more amplified when there's a smaller number of ballots. Yep. And so that's our first upcoming election. And overlapping with it, we're gonna have our primary election. So we are gearing up for the primary election on June 7th. Yep. That's gonna be a polling place election. So we're back to our polling places. You get to go in, you get to visit your school, your gym, um, your fire station, and then get to cast your ballot in person. So we're gonna mail in a month from today for that election. If you get a mail ballot, which about 80% of our active voters vote by mail, so you'll get your ballot in the mail shortly after May 13th. Okay. And then on June 7th, election day, We'll have all of our polling places open. We did relocate a couple, so you'll be seeing a mailer. If you were, um, Chief Charlotte School is gonna get relocated down to the former Cold Spring School. So you'll get a couple of mailers as we get closer to that election. 
that makes sure you know where to go and encourages you, if you want, sign up absentee. Cool. And uh, let's talk about that, uh, My Voter Page. Let's talk a little bit more about that. You bet. So My Voter Page is a fantastic tool. It's going to let you check your registration. So if you don't get a ballot for this upcoming school election, you can check it, make sure you're registered at the right address. Mm -hmm. In a federal election, in addition to checking out your information, are you registered to vote, are you an absentee voter, it'll tell you where your ballot status is. Mm -hmm. So it's been mailed out to you, yep. it's been returned, or it's been accepted. Yep. So that way you can utilize that tool. It's myvoterpagemt.com. Yep. And uh, for those of you at home who are just like, I haven't voted in a couple of years, how do I know I'm still eligible or registered? that myvoterpagemt.com. When you pull that up, it'll tell you that you're active, you're ready to go and you're gonna get a ballot in the mail, or it'll tell you you're inactive, where you're gonna to wanna to reach out to our office. The best way to get in touch with us is just give us a buzz, 258-4751. Awesome, and uh, again, like uh, when it comes to uh, um, just like people who are voting and everything like that, like um, when does it, when does like you have absentee ballot, you signed up for that, but then you don't get your absentee ballot, you can go to my voter page to confirm that you're gonna get the ballot. Exactly, and if you make a change to your address, you need to update it with the Postal Service and with the Elections yeah. Office. And the DMV. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and a whole yeah. list of other I know. Groups. It's just like, oh, you're uh, like, oh, I got pulled over. And it's like, oh, yeah, your, uh, your uh, insurance doesn't match right. your driver's license. Like, what? I have to do, do, it? I have to do that? It's like, yes. It's yep. like, ugh. And fine so with this again. Yeah. If we mail you a ballot and it comes back as undeliverable, they won't get forwarded. They'll come back as undeliverable. We'll send you a postcard or a letter in the yeah. mail. And I, my, my trick of the trade is, you know, I fill out my absentee ballot and then I drop it off at many of the uh, uh, locations that you can drop off ballots, which is county courthouse, the elections office, which is, has their new location, not at the fairgrounds, but off of Wyoming and Russell. Yep. yep. And then for the county courthouse, they still accept them down there, but there's no longer a drop box location oh. there. So we're really encouraging yeah. people to come to our new location corner of Russell and Wyoming, yeah. 140 North Russell. And I know that uh, during like uh, the other elections is that you've actually had ballot drop-offs at um, many of the locations, including here at the public library. Yeah, so this will be a polling place, and then it will have drop locations. They're all listed on the back of the instructions. We've got 10 of them throughout the entirety of Missoula County. Mm -hmm. And for the school election, any polling place can serve as a ballot drop-off location. So we've got 27 of those for the June primary election. And then in Missoula County, your postage is always prepaid, so you can always use any mailbox to get it back to us. And check myvoterpagemt.com to make sure we've got it. Cool, is there anything else you want people to know before this upcoming election? I think that one other thing that we really encourage is education and knowledge. Mm -hmm. So before each election, you can go to our website, missoulavotes.com. There's a section about election integrity, which lists off each of our different upcoming tours, some videos that people can know and understand the process, because the more you know, the more comfortable yep. you feel. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate having yeah. you in. And you can go to uh, my voter page for more information. Yeah, Missoula Votes, www.missoulavotes.com or www.myvoterpagemt.com. Okay. Well, thank you, Bradley. Thank you. Appreciate it. So Bradley Seaman has been going around doing all those uh, interviews and circuits to get people, uh, letting people know that the election is coming up. It's going to be happening in early May, the first Tuesday in May that, that follows a Monday. And then the primary is going to be happening in June. They have a, a lot of other tickets and other items that they put on the ballot as well that you can check out. Go to uh, MissoulaVotes.com. All right, let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. We're kicking things off with uh, In the Magical World of Harry Potter, which is definitely not filled with controversy uh, from an author and pretty much most of the actors and most of the things that have been happening with this uh, movie series that has basically become a nightmare. Anyway, let's take a step back from the Fantastic Beats title as we dive into yet another story about the wizard's final solution to get rid of the other Folks, muggles, um, subjected humans, all that stuff. Anyways, this movie is three out of five movie deal with the stars Eddie Redmayne, who is kind of stuck in mediocrity in these kind of films. You know, I guess he signed a contract before he got the Oscar for that um, Stephen Hawkins movie, um, Theory of Everything. You know what I mean. Anyways, follow Elvis Dumbledore as uh, he is young hot and even hotter for Grindelwald, who is basically played by a third actor who has replaced Johnny Depp 
for we won't mention it. Um, enjoy the 1920s, 30s, and maybe get into uh, yet another decade as actors are forced to look the same through five movies, which will probably take over the course of like 50 years, which will probably have something to do with the last movie, which takes place in congruently with World War II. So I'm just, I'm just saying, but at least Potterheads aren't as bad as Star Wars people, but they've been quiet since uh, Mandalorian started, so they don't really care about Harry Potter. Moving on, Father Stu, you like a good redemption story, right? Uh, enjoy Mel Gibson directed a <coughs> movie about a rough and tough guy, find God and become a preacher. Father Stu stars Mar Mark Wahlberg as the guy trying to leave his history of violence behind him and through the power of Hollywood's Based on a true story, they'll take the liberty to omit certain details to follow your typical narrative. Usually we have some kind of higher authority going was like, well, I don't know about that. And then they go, I never saw it that way. We're cool now. And that's how the movie will end. Uh, then we got some video games that came out. This one seems to be uh, trending all in around. So get yet another uh, Lego type video game where you just like, insert a lot of the same mechanics and just kind of throw it in there. So take a uh, third person shooter perspective. Um, I've never uh, played a game that glossed over so many details of Star Wars, but let's still save you some time and get to the playability. Uh, so that, you know, it's uh, get the cutscenes shorter than the actual movie. Play with Legos, video games, and Star Wars with all in one game that changes slightly and comes out with yet another Lego game based on a popular franchise. I can pretty much sure they're going to probably do the same exact thing with this, this, that they're going to do with the Harry Potter uh, Lego series. And I've never actually played the Harry Potter Lego series. I heard it was actually somewhat decent. All right. And that concludes my uh, pre-critic for you guys. Up next, we have a brand new dub and stuff. I'm kind of particularly proud of this one. So enjoy The South of Santa Fe from the 19, uh, 1945 movie. Ma'am, started to barge in well, on you. Well, technically, it wasn't barging because I opened the door. So, ma'am, ma'am, we need to borrow you a car right now. I'll tell you the same thing I told the other guy with a ten-gallon hat. No way, John Wayne. Well, come on, it'll only be a short while. No, I just got it fixed the other day. I'm gonna go grocery shopping. Well, maybe if this town was a two-horse town, but we don't have that kind of luxury here. So, we need this car as soon as possible, if you don't mind me, ma'am. Um, what about insurance? You're not insured underneath my vehicle. How dare she! She insulted us. You got to do something. You got to say something to her. Come on, use the thing. I promised myself I want to use the thing because you know what happened last time. Oh, well, shoot. Uh. Can't we do anything? Huh, we could use the Gretzky method because I worked in the past before. I know Wayne Gretzky. I can introduce you to. I don't like soccer. Huh, well, wait a minute. Hockey? Yeah, it's hockey. Yeah, it's hockey. Isn't it hockey? I'll be sure to tell you. If you just let us use your car after all, ma'am. Oh. Oh, excuse me. Uh, we'll go take care of this. Hmm. Oh, wait! D don't steal my car! Hold up, hold up! If you're taking my car, I'm going with you. Ah, doggone it. They took the only car. What do we do? I don't know. Good, let's cut them off in the pass. Well, thanks for you letting us use your car. If anything happens to it, I'm suing you guys. Well, Roy, looks like we're going to have to get a lawyer. I'm practicing law. Well, don't you think it would be a conflict of interest? What do you mean conflict of interest? To uh, represent the people that you're prosecuting? It just doesn't hmm. make any sense. Don't you agree? Well, I don't agree with that at all. Well, there's a deep line between the prosecution and witnesses and uh, the defendant. Oh, geez, shut up. You have to go back. I forgot my uh, contact lens. Is that a thing in this era? I think so. <laughs> what? You think my made-up excuses aren't real? Because they're very real. Because I said them from my you mouth. You literally just said made-up excuses. When we get back to the house, you got to make sure you grab everything before we go. Then that way, we can get everything that we need to go grocery shopping. Well, don't forget about the toy store. Yes, Roy. I, I'll take you to the toy store. I promise. And I want to go to the nail salon while you guys are out shopping for groceries. Do you think I could do oh, that? Well, of course you can. You know, we only got a couple stops to make. Oh, I promise I won't take too long. Well, I suppose there. Well, thank you. <laughs> I did not expect myself to have such a day like this. All right, let's not take too long. All right, come on, let's get going. Uh, the toys are closed at the end of the hour. We, we have to get there That's fast. That's the first place we'll go. Don't uh, worry I'm about just it. A little Listen, I, I don't want to miss out like last time. You're not going to miss out, Roy. I got you. You know that, right? 
Mm-hmm. And if you're good, I'll make sure to get you mm. two toys. You got it? I hope I get there. Wait, two toys? Wow, you can give me two toys? That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, could I get a third? Only two. Well, I shot my shot. Yeah, you sure did, Roy. Oh, these boys. I gotta turn off my own car and everything like that. Oh, this next uh, song goes out to the lady who's escaping in her own car away from some cowboys. Let's hit it. Whoa, 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 hold on a second. Come on, don't do this to us. You'll be hearing from my lawyers. You hear that? From those cowboys. You just wanna get away. I'll never get those two toys. You gotta get, gotta get, gotta get away. From those cowboys trying to take your car away. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's kick things off with some city council. We're kicking. Uh, the first thing we were going to talk about is public comment. And during the public comment, Mark McMillan, uh, during public comment, asked the council to do more in terms of how the Veterans Day has been poorly attended. Not to mention the streets weren't closed and there uh, for the intersection for the ceremonies. And they said that they should try to do a little bit better in terms of permitting. So this is what Mark McMillan had to say. The Animal Walk, or at least in the past, the Animal Walk, Sunday Streets, uh, River City Roots. I was going to see if anybody on council might be able to kind of take this bull by the horns. I pulled up the MDT special use because um, Broadway is going to be probably listed as a state controlled road. Um, it doesn't seem that tough. It's one page, pretty simple. But rather than fill this out with an individual's name, the hope is to have like the city of Missoula be the applicant or maybe somebody from the Legion. Uh, or VFW. But yeah, just in running with this, you guys would know how to do this best or the people that run all these other events that we have. So rather than bring you this big mess, it was like, here's a few examples. I will draft an email from Bill and I, uh, just as an official request to all of council for this. So the unfortunate nature of uh, that, those particular comments actually brings up my next point, and um, many organizations uh, that put on uh, shows our Missoula Downtown Partnerships through their own relationship with the city is able to put up these big shows. But in recent years, I've also noticed the overall lack of interest in younger veterans taking up duties that would be for the VFW type organizations and their veterans affairs. Uh, I've interviewed uh, folks like Susan Campbell Renault, who is uh, soldiering along and trying to promote these kind of Veterans Day, Memorial Day kind of uh, deals, but it just been lower and lower attended every single year. And she's kind of like been a, a one man army in this particular case, just uh, based on anecdotal evidence of you know, us going to those shoots and uh, filming a lot of those uh, ceremonies from this and that. Uh, you know, it's just uh, Montana has the highest per capita of military establishment in the nation at 85,000 veterans in the state alone. Alaska has more per capita at 65,000 per capita, while Virginia has the overall record for more than half a million veterans. Uh, you know, Montana, as I see it in Missoula, is aging, and even the organiza- organizers are starting to slow down as well. So there's uh, this there needs to be a little bit more activity with the younger veterans getting into this part uh, to uh, help out with the uh, uh, the uh, organization and everything like that. So that's definitely one of the things that I overly noticed is that there's just an overall lack of uh, veteran uh, uh, um, being involved in part of these ceremonies as well. So uh, anyways, uh, um, up next, uh, we have Joe, once again, who came out to confront the city about the heavily armed Rogers International Security, and he grabbed this p- specific excerpt because he says that, uh, that uh, through his uh, research, he determined that uh, they used equipment that is uh, potentially dangerous even to themselves. This is called a Serpa holster from Black Hawk. This one cost me about 140 bucks. This costs about 50 I picked it up at ta- uh, Cabela's today. It's also level two. The button you click is here. These are banned by law enforcement, they're banned by any all the tactical shooting courses that I've taken because these are dangerous. Because what you'll see, if you go to pull your weapon, you initiate the release with your trigger finger, and if you're stressed out, that pressure stays up, your hand's here, and you can go on YouTube and watch a lot of people punch holes through their legs uh, with using these holsters. You'll also see these being used by Rogers International employees uh, at the camps. So all of those things together kind of lead me to make three conclusions. The first conclusion is there is a dangerous lack of safety and uh, training among RI employees. That's a huge one. For me, as a very uh, safety-conscious individual, that's 
he wants. All right. So uh, one of the things I definitely wanted to make a point of is that uh, Joe has been um, uh, on a uh, basically uh, targeting um, the what ifs in terms of Roger's security, in terms of like, oh, what can potentially happen with the ideas like, oh, they're heavily armed, so therefore they're going to be um, a huge issue. But again, I'm going to reiterate, like I've been really reiterating for the last couple of weeks, this is a private business and are not under the same scrutiny as the police department because they act as a contractors as uh, the liability usually falls upon those who hire them, hence the city. So it's a little bit confusing because uh, how the police is so intertwined with the, the city of Missoula, while Rogers International is more just like a contractor who are just hiring out to do this particular thing. And um, I mean, a lot of times from even the city's perspective, it's been nothing but a positive experience from both uh, the, the clients within these uh, uh, shelter spaces and uh, Palvarella Center, and I will say that again, like I said before again, the city pays, they can have complete oversight on, over how they run the security, uh, they are not police officers, and like our Phoenix security here at the library, they can ask them to mitigate the use of their arms, and um, here at uh, the library, uh, the Phoenix security don't even carry guns, so uh, I'm going to kind of leave it there, I know we're, we're, it's probably going to be kind of ongoing throughout more and more and stuff like that but it always seems like it's like the potential of violence rather than the actual uh, effect of it as well so some of the things you know it's it, it's it's interesting like it's it's very much from the outsider kind of looking and being like oh they shouldn't be doing that if it was me i do this so that's kind of what i fear feel as though that that it's getting interesting. But of course, the next topic about addressing issues within the city getting too involved with development, Mike Nugent reflects on the Greeno Heights and more. When we're talking about these developments, there seems to be a, a appetite for density, but I can understand based on kind of past history why some developers don't push for maximum density because you know, even in the comments on the last subdivision that we approved that uh, my colleague, Ms. Jordan referenced, you know, some of the comments talked about the developer trying to shoehorn as many houses in as possible to maximize their profit and things like that. So I think that we just need to be aware of, of how we have this conversation. And if a project comes in that's that's closer to the higher end of the density that we call for in growth plan, you know, maybe we should be embracing that more than more than we have. I also think that as we do code reform um, and, and uh, you know, my, my colleague, Mr. Carino, Carlino is kind of getting at it. As we do code reform, I think that that we need to look and see how how our new code, how our new zoning matches maybe the, the higher end of some of our density because that does seem to be um, more of the appetite that, that we're hearing. Okay, so uh, Mike Nugent was talking in terms about you know, like how we're so reactionary to the particular housing crisis. Projects are coming and going and the city has been involved with the many processes to the point that housing needs inventory regardless of affordability. Entry level homes to bigger homes and downsizing options. You cannot raise a family in a starter home, especially as folks become more and more content with downsizing based on budget. Housing problems, am I right? And I think it's just one of the things that, uh, that the city is trying to uh, mitigate and evolve uh, based on the our Missoula, growth uh, our Missoula growth policy, which was established back in 2018 and slowly implemented over the last couple of years, rezoning changes and stuff like that. But when it comes down to the brass tax of things like private owners um, where the city has no stake on that property, um, can pretty much do whatever they want in terms of code and uh, the zoning that they can do. So zoning can be like, oh, you can have anywhere between 13 and 20 houses on this property. So then the developer can uh, be as uh, liberal or conservative based on their allowances and how they feel about it. Uh, but pretty much it's uh, the concept of um, the city being having too much uh, say and too much involved in certain departments. But at the same time, when it comes down to it, it's you're dealing with private property and um, a lot of the, uh, the private owner slash the developer have say in what they're going to do with that property in the end. So um, up next, we have a public hearing on the sewer and water for uh, Mullen Bill project. I've been talking about this for the last couple of weeks. Uh, Logan McInnes, the engineer of uh, Missoula Water, talks about the money that they necessarily can't tap into. The bill grant itself was $13 million. It did not include any funds uh, to pay for utilities, as I noted earlier. And again, the utilities must be installed before these new build roads can be constructed. And again, the city agreed to, to bridge the gap to finance installation of these utilities until a latecomer fee could be established to collect those uh, costs back from the developers who are benefiting from these investments. 
Okay, so the big thing they wanted to mention as well that they're on a time crunch as their as development is starting to uh, click up again and they're trying to see about getting some more money. Logan McGinnis, the engineer for Missoula Water Company, uh, went on to say that the developer will incur the cost of the water slash sewer utility and in terms would go to the buy, uh, the, the, those buying the property um, with the, the rates to accumulate the cost. However, because they have uh, connections near the site in question, the developer will have to be uh, how will be able to concentrate on the water sewer mains on their property they develop and not the pipes leading to it they do it in a way uh, and they, they they do it anyways and property owners have to pay for their own water mains if they break if not right away water mains are technically the homeowners problems therefore the developers must wait until selling so according to Logan this ain't gonna be cheap and this is some of the uh, costs in the brass tax so uh, uh, keep your eyes peeled. There's a lot of numbers on here, so here's Logan. And, you know, the fees are substantial. It's it's certainly expensive to run water and sewer mains, but like I said, these are costs that they would have been responsible to pay anyways. Total fees for water for the development uh, developers would be about 2.3 million. Um, the city's paying about 56,000 for the water main under the roundabout, and then about 205 thousand dollars. The city's paying in upsizing costs for total water investment in the mobile build project is about 2.61 million. And as you can see here as well as that, the over cost with uh, not only water but wastewater is going to be uh, nearing $4 million for all the installation and development as well. But then again, you got to understand that this is an investment with on the city's part. It is a public utility now and it's not a private company. So they, uh, within the city of Missoula, since the city of Missoula is so ingrained in this particular build project um, to basically change 44.6 acres of uh, uh, potential land into a housing development, uh, suburban kind of neighborhoods, high density, mixed use, just a lot of different uh, opportunities there. And that $13 million um, is, is, it's kind of short of what their target goal is, which is $23 million total in which they hope to be using the raised funds, which is the uh, evolution of what the build grant was all about. And this is part of the build back better. So they're applying for that raised grant. And overall, this meeting was short, but a lot of points were made throughout about our ever growing city and folks on council being on top of things effectively. So com uh, community meetings, not much to say, but appointments to various boards and communities throughout th that. And I usually skip over interviews because that's kind of pointless because uh, we want to see what they're doing and not what they're uh, potentially going to do. So we're going to skip that and we're going to go right over to Committee of the Whole. In 2021, Missoula used a land trust to create a whole new system on affordable housing and worked with developers Rivara with housing in the nine acres off of Scott Street on the north side. So the city has a couple acres and then the rest of it are going to be developed into uh, whatever the developer sees. And it's going to be kind of like a new kind of neighborhood kind of uh, area within those nine um, acres. John Adams, project administrator for the city, talks about the Community Land Trust. And the Community Land Trust is a nonprofit organization that holds land and trust for a community in order to provide lasting assets and shared equity homeownership opportunities for everyday neighbors. At heart, the land trust owns the land, uh, whereas homeowners own their homes on top and lease the land. Uh, below their houses. And so essentially, the land trust buys down the cost of housing for their for the homeowners um, by providing the land uh, rent free. And then in turn, in this case, the city will provide that land donation to NMCDC, the Community Land Trust. It's a model that enables uh, particularly first time and uh, first time homeowners of limited means to get into the housing market and begin to build equity um, and uh, own their own homes and enjoy all the benefits thereof. But the CLTs, the community land trust typically, and in this case would administer the um, homes with restrictions on resale so that they remain permanently affordable. In other words, the first buyer can't simply acquire a house and then flip it. And that's one of the things that uh, um, is, is in big concern these days is that you're having a lot of uh, 
businesses buying up properties and uh, property management buying up properties as well. And as you know, there's, there's a hotbed of folks buying and selling homes while the rest of the people struggling to find their first home slash starter homes on this market. So a lot of times their starter homes just turn out to be their forever homes just because they can't leverage this land um, to create more affordable house. So they want to leverage the land to create more affordable housing. Um, and part of this is that because of the numbers and they're trying to keep it down and development costs, you know, cost of material and stuff like that. This is the only people who are going to be eligible are the folks that are 120% of the me, um, um, average area median income. So which means they, uh, they, 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 the, the implication between the 120% is the idea that you have two people moving in and investing in this house with each making about 60% the area income, which is roughly about $24,000, $25,000 a year, which uh, frankly isn't necessarily minimum wage. So it's interesting, but imagine it being hard for a couple to buy a home. Single peeps out there, it just, it's just not going to happen. A lot of times in this market, unless you have a white collar job, uh, which also is a little lax. So it's, there's a lot of issues going into this as well. So it's, uh, people have to find a way to hustle and figure out how much they're uh, in a way to get a, be able to get over this part. But Bob Oaks, he gives a public comment about that 120 um, area income. Um, and what we have done, our community land trust homes, uh, we've developed 54 uh, over the last 20 years and we, we steward them. But those, those, uh, those, those homes all had HUD money involved, and that, that means that they were, that people had, households had to be under 80% of area median income. And this, this uh, up to 120%, we hope to get, uh, we hope that the developers are able to bring homes in for households that are from 80 to 120% or the missing middle that we always hear talked about. All right. So that was Bob Oaks talking about that. And yeah, it's 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 struggling all around. It's just not they're trying to stay ahead of the inflation and work with developers for VARA in implementing housing on the site, which also includes city's inputs through design. The city owns the land and they spoke about the former industrial site and they did a study that to give it that clean bill of health, just in case some of you are worried about that part of it. Um, Northside has been talking about what to do with that site for many years now, and it was a big item on the our Missoula growth policy. And I've been talking, and Northside's been being talked about about what potentially it could be, and then of course the crisis happened, and now it's just like any, anybody who um, it's a it's a big time selling market for sure because uh, housing is uh, ridiculously high, and you, you just really can't. Um, buy a home, especially if you go to a realtor. So you have to figure out a way to uh, get uh, direct uh, contact with uh, landlords and see about selling and buying your house. Uh, that's that's not a, uh, a the best solution, but it's also uh, not the worst solution either. So and, um, so up next, we talk about affordable housing committee and how they invest in housing projects like the Scott Street on the north side. So this is the affordable housing uh, oversight committee, and they meet every second Wednesday of the month. Emily Harris Shears, she's the community development and planning with the Community Land Trust, and she talks a little bit more about um, some of the numbers in which the money uh, we have money set aside from uh, rescue funds, ARPA, CARES Act, all that stuff uh, made for this and figuring out how to uh, fill this up to be able to distribute it with projects that have a bigger bang for the impact. And this is so this, well, let's talk about some of the money that they have available for people in Missoula. So for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, uh, we had $1,046,200 available to award. Uh, we received a total of six projects that were eligible to receive trust fund dollars. And uh, the total, we were oversubscribed by about $371,000. Okay, so you can kind of see the, uh, the, you saw from there, like you saw like they are more than a, a million dollars. Last year when they first started, it was about a $300,000 and they weren't able to really fund that many programs. And the only one that they really funded was the uh, United Way for the Consumer Housing Services Project. And basically this would mean like if people are basically on the verge of eviction, they can have a saving grace with some of the $26,000 of that $300,000. But they want to award $190,000 for Habitat Humanities to make a total of two houses um, with an offer of 80% of the average medium income for those who qualify. 
And yeah, this wasn't the first time Habitat has requested funds from the community. However, they've uh, had to shelve this until now, and Emily explains how, uh, uh, how time-sensitive um, this approval is. I think one of the realities of having projects that are both um, getting started and then also in process is that there will be at times an urgency from us. Um, it will also be the reality of our reserve balance fund that projects will come that need a quick response. And we wanna be as nimble and flexible to that as possible. Um, they have a urgency to move these out of a storage facility that the city owns. And so that is part of why they're unable to move and wait until June um, or July when the contracts would start. They asked us to make this um, adjustment and we agreed to do that. Okay. So uh, that's kind of what's happening uh, there. Um, this was approved and we'll go on to create two new homes in East Missoula, which is also considered a uh, rural county to count county zoning. Um, the money and, and also uh, living in rural areas, the suburban kind of light, the, the suburban kind of uh, ideology is something that a lot of people um, can go to as well. Uh, the Humans and Resource Council is a great uh, resource, which I also utilize to help buy me my home. Um, and they give even more money for people who uh, move out of the city. So it's it's it, there's a lot of things going on there with larger funding mechanisms through HUD, CD, BG, and of course HOME, all federal funding grants that tend to go towards projects that are in the works. Grant money is a funny money because a lot of times you, uh, most of the time they ask for matching funds. They don't just give money outright. And, and when they do give money, you need to make sure that everything's been counted, every little uh, uh, thing that was bought has been bought, um, and receipts, a lot of stuff like that. So grants, uh, it's, it's a very interesting, but of course we're at a very uh, turmoil, tumultuous time, which kind of sees like so it's too easy for something to just kind of fall through the cracks. But uh, the Affordable Housing Committee for Missoula meets every second Wednesday of the month. Their goal is to put money into affordable housing and to get more bang for their buck. They started with about $300,000 in their budget and they ha have been wary to spend it. I have not seen um, too much money from this since the 26,000 for United Way, but hopefully this uh, project will knock down the six projects slated to about five. So simple math, but please uh, watch and look up these meetings on your own. They are available at the city's website at ci.missoula.mt.us or find them on their YouTube page under City of Missoula. All in all, you can find everything on MCAT. You can go to MCAT.org. You can watch the video on demand. You can watch this show. You can watch the city council show. And it is a mixture of both our channels 189 and 190. Up next, we have a big event happening uh, exactly uh, six days. Well, I don't want to timestamp it too much, but it's going to start on April 21st and it goes well into the weekend. Orchard Homes um, is going to be the host site for a used book sale with the American Association of University Women of Missoula. And I got a chance to uh, uh, bump into them and have a quick interview with them. So uh, here's this. And then when I come back, we're going to talk, talk about some other events that are happening this weekend. Hey folks, we are back. We're here with uh, Cindy and Nancy, and they're with the uh, used book sale that's happening at Orchard Homes starting on the 21st and going through that weekend. So a four-day weekend of used book sale extravaganza, yeah, all that that's stuff. It. So what can you tell people about uh, this book sale? Well, I'll just start by saying a little history that actually, aside from the last two years during COVID where we had to cancel this book sale, it's been going for 62 years wow. in Missoula, and people look forward to it greatly and so it's it's a cooperative effort between AAUW which is the American Association of University Women and PDK which is Phi Delta Kappa um, which is an organization professional organization for educators oh. and we have one other we yes. have oh, yes. WMREA which is the Western Montana Retired Educator Association there you go. <laughs> uh, so it's a partnership among these three organizations. Yeah, and um, um, Cindy here was telling me about the money that you raise here goes towards helping women at the university and more. We like to tell people yeah. what they're contributing to when they bring books or buy books. And so we've done things like we recently co-sponsored the President's Lecture Series on campus, which was about a history of women's suffrage. Um, we've helped promote girls' participation in science and math through robotics team support. We help train nurses who conduct sexual assault exams. And we do workshops on campus for women to learn how to um, negotiate their salaries so they don't get left behind. Nice. 
And so, you know, for those uh, of you watching at home, if you want to know the schedule, Thursday, April 21st is the first day. It's happening from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Friday, the 22nd, and Saturday, the 23rd, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. both days, and then your last chance to check it out is the Sunday, and that's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., in which you guys have a $10 bag sale, but also for the first day, for some of the early birds wanting to get in a little bit earlier, they can pay a $5 fee to get in. That's right, and they get the best selection of all those wonderful books that we have. So many people have decided to do that because they know what they're looking for and they yeah. get in right away. And for those of yeah. you not familiar with the location of Orchard Homes, it's just off of uh, Reserve Street on 3rd Street, just a little bit further down up towards the mountains. Mm -hmm. yep. yep, it's a well-known spot and lots of parking and... Um, if you want to donate, you can come on Monday and Tuesday before the sale um, between 10 and 5 and bring nice books such as we have here. We brought a few just to show you. We need books that we can sell that are, you know, uh, quality books and in good condition. And we don't take things like encyclopedias and right. magazines and all. But Textbooks. No textbooks. No textbooks. Because right. <laughs> honestly, as soon as they print textbooks, it's already outdated yeah. at that point. It doesn't take long. It does not take long at all. But can we show you a couple? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. So these are just a plenty of the examples of books that you might be able examples. to see here. Yes. Examples. Yeah, you always yeah. want to keep the books in pristine condition. You don't want to accept any donations of run-down old books. Right, right. But that you also have opportunities for what you were saying earlier when we were talking about a first editions. Right. We have a special collections area for older books that people are looking for, classics that are in good condition for their age, um, maybe first editions. Sometimes people have a collection and there's one book missing and that fills that need or something. But other than that, books like, well, we'll show you a few. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Copper Camp, which was written in the 40s about Butte, and it's been reprinted, of course, and it uh, was written by people who participated in the Works Project Administration. So they needed work at the time, and they chronicled some interesting stories about Butte. Another um, Montana books one is John Tester's book, Grounded, which many people have found interesting because he talks about growing up in Montana and how he's yeah. taking those lessons to heart when he's in Washington to the best of his ability. And Nancy has some. Yes, I have a few here. Uh, <laughs> this one entitled Missoula, uh, uh. which uh, is a nice record of Missoula in the past and in the present. We do have quite a section each year called uh, Missoula and Montana, and that section is extremely popular. Mm -hmm. uh, books and reads that are about this area or uh, novels that take place here, the, the collection is usually exceptionally good and people love it. So uh, that might be a reason right there. Uh, this is an example of a current novel. Uh, this is uh, Grisham's latest novel and uh, it's called Suli and it's a very great read. I, mm. I enjoyed this read immensely, but uh, you will find things like this. Yeah. I mean, this is brand new. Yeah. This is of the moment, and uh, it would be available yeah. there. And, you know, these are the times of, like, you know, rummage sales, spring cleaning. You know, people are getting rid of a lot of their stuff as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a perfect time for people to jump on these kind of events that are happening, get some used books, you know, update their library and all that stuff. And, yeah, but some other books you want to talk about as yes. well. Looks like, yes. ooh, Van Gogh. Oh, yeah, I, I love this. Yes. Uh, this is uh, all about Van Gogh and his wonderful paintings. I bring this as an example of uh, the art books. And uh, there are always uh, yeah. a lot of art books, wonderful collection of uh historic books and books about painters, also books on how to paint. Yes. yes. And this is a great way for people to collect their own, kind of build up their own collection. You also meant, um, I also talked to Cindy a little bit earlier, and she said that there's going to be uh, sell by inches, too. Yes, we just stack so. them all up and measure the height. So if this is, uh, let's say it's five inches, at $2 per inch, wow. you would get this whole batch for... Ten dollars. Wow. I mean, that's, that's a deal. Huh? That's that is a, a great deal. deal. That's a deal. Thank you. And where can people find more information about your event? I know that you guys have a Facebook page, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's oh, under yes. AAUW, and so the information is there. So AAUW Missoula Facebook page, 
Um, you're welcome to call me, Cindy, at 406-207-6036. There's one other thing I, I am thinking about, which is we organize the books. We have tables that are just hardback novels. We have tables that are, as I mentioned earlier, uh, connected to Montana and Missoula. There's a children, children's section, uh, historic uh, biographies, an arts section. There's a religion section. What have I missed? There's even a romance novel. Romance section. novels. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yes, and travel and language and yes. on and on. But that's a good point because you can find it easily. Yeah. You can find things easily. And we usually, year after year, set things up in a very similar manner. So if you have been there other years and you have a favorite section, it'll probably be located in just about the same spot. Sweet. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. you for interviewing us <laughs> yeah. and yeah. letting us uh, talk about the sale. We're pretty excited about it, especially since there's been a two-year break, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're very glad to be back. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, guys. Welcome back. Let's talk about some events that are happening this weekend. If you're interested in doing anything here at the library, the library is hosting a caveat. Caveat of many different things. If you're interested in doing some watercolor or doing some yarn stitching, making your own clothes and scarves, they do that at noon on the fourth floor here at the Public Library. Spectrum Discovery Center has a science based activities happening from Tuesday through Saturday starting at 10 a.m. to about 6 p.m. Um, also, one big thing that's happening at uh, 1030 is that Tiny Tales and Storytime happens on uh, Friday and Saturday here at the library at 1030 a.m. and it's a great way for kids to get engaged with reading and enjoy a tiny town on the second floor of the library. Read Re Regime and Empower Place, Missoula Food Bank and Community Center. Uh, Regime serves a, a full fun new story and crafts every Friday at 10.30 a.m. Um, so this is an extension of the public library um, and also different other organizations, but a little about Empower Place. They handle hands-on learning centers across, uh, located at the Missoula Food Bank and Community Center dedicated to nourishing bodies and minds through children and family. The part of the community center, one part science museum, one part food hub, and one part library. There's something there for everyone in Power Place. So that's happening every uh, Friday at the uh, Missoula Food Bank and Community Center. All right. Then they have uh, the sober walking group at noon, the Phoenix, Missoula. This is going to be at the Rattlesnake Trail. You're going to meet up with people. They do ask that people are at least uh, 48 hours sober before they join this part of the Phoenix, Missoula. Consult drop-in day, family's first learning lab. So uh, if, you're if you're a parent who's struggling with your kid, you may be doing some major stressful situations, you need a little help with your kid who is a reflection of yourself, family's first learning lab can help you with that and they happen here at the library on the second floor at one in the afternoon. You can bring your kid here to play and then you can uh, get the help that you need. All right, Young Adults Writing Group uh, at 3.15 in the afternoon. Um, the library also has an adult writers group along with um, MCAT has our do uh, Adobe lessons at 3 and 4 p.m. So they do, we do Photoshop, we do uh, Adobe Premiere editing, anything to do with video stuff. So all that stuff is happening this afternoon. Later on in the day at Radius Gallery, a uh, five-week dedication to Crimeorama. Ceramorama, sorry, it's ceramics, um, and it's a five-week dedicated to the continual celebration of functional ceramics. Each Friday in April, they'll have a new reception with an impressive array of great functional pottery from local, national, and international makers. So this is pretty much ongoing out throughout the museum. You can check them out during their open hours, and they're located downtown, and they're open most hours from 11 to about, uh, I want to say, 7, 8 o'clock. Hours might be a little bit different, but... It's in our gallery. You can look up at the Radius Gallery on the Google. Um, John Ruff, uh, Ruffato, Business Startup Challenge, is going to be at the University of Montana. Propel your ID forward. Hey, you're a you're, you're person who, ha who has a lot of ideas but doesn't really have that much business sense. The 33rd Annual John Ruffato Business Startup Challenge is scheduled to take place in person Friday, April 15th uh, at 5 p.m. Reserve a seat RSVP on the Grizz Hub event page. Go to umt.edu for more information about this. And this is going to be from 5 to 8 p.m. But at the uh, Alley, Alley Auditorium in the Phyllis J. Washington College of Education on the campus of the University of Montana. It's the building that's shaped like a book behind the music 
uh, center. Mu uh, like the music hall? The music building. That's the word I was looking for. Building. <laughs> Who knew? Um, but that's happening. That's up there. It's with the UM's Blackstone Launchpad with the UM College of Business Sponsors. Two competition, the epic pitch competition, and this one that they're doing as well. All right, uh, tonight as well is they're doing Blue Shadow at the Highlander. It's going to be at the Highlander beer location. Cheap date night, so if you're uh, interested in coming to the library after hours, um, from 6.30 to 9 p.m., it's on the fourth floor and jury recently released feature film called Cheap Date Night. The third Friday of every month, the library Cooper Room, April's film selection screening of the 2017 film Walking Out with film directors Alex and Andrew Smith. This film screening discussions are in conjunction with the Missoula Public Library's larger series, Reimagining Death, Conversation About Dying Loss, and the Grief in Partnership with UM Humanities Institute. So this is about 93 minutes of your life. Doors are open from 6.15 to 6.45 p.m., and the film starts at 6.30. Late entry is not allowed. Um, attendees must <laughs> enter from the library's parking garage. All other doors will be locked. So parking garage, any parking places all over the place, go right through and you're good to go. But who knows our names by, Der uh, by Dr. Derek Brooms at the University of Montana. This talk, Dr. Derek Brooms explores the meaning of anti-blackness in the 21st century through the lens of current and recent events of the U.S., particularly those reported out in the local and national news media outlets. In addition, he pairs with a discussion with black men about their lives, experience, and sense of making and navigating race and racism, bringing together a public discourse of narratives along with voices and viewpoints of black men are critical as it allows for rereading and reinterpretation of race and justice and how these matter in black people's lives. And this is going to be at 7.30 p.m. at the University of Montana in the Eck Hall Room 11 on campus. All right, so here are some of your music events that are happening up for Friday night. Kenny James Miller Band is going to be in the Old Post. Old Post. Um, live music is going to be Kyle Curtis Jazz Trio at Stave and Hoop Speakeasy. Uh, when the Dust Settles is going to be at Westside Theater. Uh, the Drip featuring DJ Auntie E is going to be at Monk's Bar. And these are all these late night events, 7 to later. And there's a, kind of like a, a roundup for that. I don't have much time to talk about it, so I'm going to kick things off with some Saturday events as well as we're inching closer and closer to the farmer's market beginning in downtown Missoula, which starts in the first weekend in May. Uh, but you guys can check that out at the Orchard Homes also has their um, farmer's market and the Southgate Mall also has their farmer's market as well. And it happens from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, Bitterroot Runoff Trail Runs, if you're interested in doing a run, kick off a trail racing season in M Montana with the Bitterroot Runoff Trail Run starting at 8 a.m. at Russell Ganol uh, Ranch. Uh, regardless of your skill level, Bitter Runoff is something for everyone. 5K, 5 mile, and 10 mile courses, they're options for everybody. And this is uh, Rosing Knoll Ranch outside of Lolo, Montana. You can find all these at MissoulaEvents.net. Um, there, hey, hey, if you're interested in playing some softball and you don't have a team, the Missoula Softball Association is holding an annual player pickup day for adult slow pitch softball players and captains. And you're new to Missoula and you're looking to join a team and meet like-minded footballers or just uh, looking to mix things up for a year. It, so it's a softball pickup day, but they put footballs in there. So somebody copied and pasted. So anyways, this is from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. at McCormick Park. It's pretty much dead center um, of Missoula, just off of the side of the river. So McCormick Park off of Wyoming Street. Actually, the, the, the street becomes Wyoming Street. Anyways, I don't want to talk about it too much because I have a lot of other things to talk about as well. Also happening in McCormick Park is the service members and families Easter egg hunt. So it is Easter weekend, so there's a lot of stuff happening. And uh, McCormick Park is also hosting an Easter egg hunt for BFW veterans. Post 209 is hosting and the fire department Saturday from 11 a.m. And they, for the Easter egg hunt, this event is for service members and their families. This includes veterans, active duty, military, EMT, firefighters, law enforcement, etc. Teen Open Studio, Missoula Art Museum. If you're a teenager or you have a teenager who has, who's very interested in art sketches and all that stuff, the uh, Missoula Art Museum has an uh, open drop-in at 12.30 p.m. If your kid is into movies and making videos and doing some stop animation, MCAT's the place to be. Every Saturday, MCAT hosts a Saturday drop-in from 1 to 3 p.m. Get kids interested in stop animation and making videos. Compost bike ride at Soil Cycle collects the food scraps year-round and delivers the compost to spring and fall by bicycle. This time of year, reward your compost members with rich, healthy soil. And so you can sign up and through the link at MissoulaEvents.net. I pretty much am getting like borderline close to the end of the show. I have about a minute left. Picnic in the Park, Redfern Park is going to at 4 p.m. on Saturday. Uh, Dusty Drennan is going to be at DraftWorks Bar, uh, Brewery. Live music with Dan Debake is going to be at Cranky Sam. Sorry, I mispronounced it. 
uh, Pain and Sip, Lunar Phrases at Painting of a Twist, Sundog North at the Old Post. Uh, ben Roy is going to be at the ABFW Post 209, their bar. And um, When the Dust Settles is going to be at the West Side Theater, um, Solid Snake Karaoke, West Side Lanes. Chris Moon is going to be at the Badlander. Sunday is Easter. Uh, all sorts of fun things happening this week, and I know that, I don't know if the university is doing their Easter egg hunt. You might have to check that out at the uh, university events at umt.edu slash events. But that pretty much does it for my morning show, and I want to thank you guys for joining me and for Wake Up Missoula. I'm Scott Ramph.